Hi, my name is Brittany. Thank you so much for checking out VBF Live. Head to our website, vbf.org, and while you're there, you can check out our latest message. Follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can donate to our ministry by going to our website and clicking the Tithe Here button, or you can mail us a check. If you have a cool story you would like to share with us, you can email it to us at share at vbf.org. Thank you so much for watching VBF Online. We hope you enjoy the message. Hey guys, how's everybody doing today? Please stand on your feet. I'm gonna pray for service. I'm gonna pray that God just speaks to you today. Let's just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the house of the Lord, God. We thank you that we have a place that we can worship you. We can hear your word today. God, so I just pray, God, anoint this service to worship Pastor Ron, God, as he delivers the message. But then open up our hearts to be receivable today, God. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Your shame's done all it's stealing. And you'll test me for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Come on, church, we sing. He makes a way.
God, we give you the praise. You may be seated. Hi, church. I'm excited to share with you all about the Halloween outreach that we have planned. We're calling it Light Up the Night, and we basically hope to reach the neighborhoods all over our city with the love of Christ. We're going to pro provide those homes that host with candy, glow sticks, VBF um, invite cards, stickers, a yard sign, and even some lights. So if that sounds like something that you would love to be part of, you can send an email to melanie at vbf.org. Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? You guys doing good? You guys made it. Sunday morning service. I got a couple of announcements, and then uh, we have another amazing worship song, and then we're going to get started with what God is going to do in this place. So if this is your first time, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome everyone online as well. Um, raise a hand. Is is there anyone? This is your first time at church? Okay, I see a few of you. Okay, welcome to the VBF family. You guys you guys are here. Get connected. Um we do have a free gift just for you. If this is your first time, stop at the hub. But this is really what it is. It's just a way for us to connect with you. It's a way for us to know who you are, for you to know who we are, and to get you connected before uh, you guys leave this place. The whole goal of why we even have church is to come together as a group of people and be the body of Christ. And, and we do that with um, not just meeting on Sundays and Wednesdays, but getting in groups where we can meet throughout the week um, when problems arise. So if that is you and you've been looking for a community, Get connected before you leave this place, um, and we'll do our best to put you in a place where um, best fits. So with that being said, here are a couple of announcements. Like that video was saying, Light Up the Night is our Hall or Harvest Festival. Um, what we're going to be doing is... Um, kind of just provide bringing Jesus back into the streets. And so if you can help us bring candy donations Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. so that we can provide some candy uh, to those houses who are giving out candy, uh, that would be amazing. But another event, uh, women's retreat where all the ladies at. You guys never disappoint. It's been a minute, huh? 
Uh, conference only tickets are being sold right now. This is uh, for our mer or for our women's retreat. So if uh, you don't have a hotel yet, you can go look for a spot, uh, maybe even carpool with someone, and then you can still be a part of what we have going on. But there are conference only tickets, and you can sign up at vbfwomen.com. All right, now this one is our marriage retreat. Where are the couples at? So the rest of them are like praying somewhere. Um, so for the marriage retreat, January 12th through the 14th, check this out. We got Embassy Suites in San Luis Obispo. It's $499 per couple, uh, but this includes a two-night stay in a suite. All resort and parking fees are included, made-to-order breakfast, and it's just a new revamped marriage retreat. So if you're on the fence of deciding whether or not to go it will only benefit you so come out you can get connected with other uh, married couples in this place a great way to stay connected and then we have a vbf off the mountain podcast that streams every tuesday that's at 7 a.m if you want uh, to be a part of something cool and listen to something great uh, these are topics that go way beyond what we talk about on sunday morning and this is uh, pastor ron vietti pastor josh vietti pastor tom touchstone and vince sierra we do have something special. I'm going to invite Pastor Steve Tedder out here to, uh, to give you guys a bit of more information of what we got going on in our church. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. You guys are a partner in ministry with VBF because not only when you give to this church financially, you give to many other organizations and ministries throughout the world. First off, we support uh, orphanages and Christian education in Africa, building schools and ministering to those remote places. We also have the Encourage Help ministry locally. Sonia Ricci and team have been giving beds and blankets and other things to people in need. Uh, we, we make the foster care bags to help kids who, who don't have a lot and moving from place to place. Thank you for partnering with that. Um, we have our Friendsgiving event come right before Thanksgiving. Israel, we're going to be supporting um, organizations over there currently, like Samaritan's Purse and possibly and some other Christian or organizations to help those in need. Uh, Teen Challenge, we help. The Mission at Kern County, Mercy House Centers, Bakersfield Crisis Pregnancy Center, block parties in your own neighborhoods, and other churches in this community. So everything you do and partner with this ministry, you're not just giving to the church, but you're giving to multiple places. And thank you for being a partner with us. And yes. And last thing, Proverbs 11:25 says a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Amen. All right. Well, may the Lord bless you. You guys have a wonderful th day, and thank you for being a partner at VBF. Thanks, Pastor Steve. He also got a way better good morning, but uh, I'll drop it there. Uh, like he was saying, the Friendsgiving event, that's going to be November 22nd. We're going to have a big old table right here, family style, for people in need. So we need your help to bring boxed mashed potatoes and boxed stuffing for that Friendsgiving event. Um, if, you, if you know of someone who can help us out with that, that would also be great. And then we do have a volunteer of the week. We have Andy Whitehead, everyone. Where's he at? Oh, he's right here. Stand up, Andy. Let, let the congregation see you. That's Andy, everyone. He's been serving since March 20th of 2013. Uh, he's in the K and First Kids Ministry. Amazing guy. Always has a smile on his face. Give him a high five. Encourage him. I, if you want to get connected, talk to him. He'll tell you how to get connected. And then uh, last but not least, ties and offerings. You guys know the drill. We have these purple baskets. We have a kiosk in the foyer. You can go to our website at vbf.org or mail a check in to 2300 East Brundage Lane. But with that being said, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. We have another amazing worship song, and then we're going to get started with this morning. And let's bow our heads and pray this. God, we come before you, and we give you glory for today. God, we thank you for the breath in our lungs, God, the joy in our hearts. And Father, if there are things in our life, God, circumstances that we still don't have solutions to, would you remind us that you're in control? God, would you remind us that you are good? God, would you remind us that you have a plan and a purpose, God, regardless if we see it or we don't? So, Father, I pray right now over every single person that we come expecting to hear your word. God, we ask that you bless the giver, bless the offering, and bless the receiver. In Jesus' name, and I got people set. Amen. Well, come on, let's stand back up together. Wandering into the night, wanting to play. 
place too high This weary soul Is back of bones I try with all my mind But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A bag of bones Joe. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Got to keep my pants up here. My wife said, you're getting too skinny. Uh, I'm doing these 72-hour fasts every month or six weeks, and I feel really good, but man, I'll tell you what, they're tough. They're tough. So, you all doing good today? Good, good, good. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. He made it. Do you know what? The Lord could be coming back at 420 this afternoon. Now, he says he'll come back at a time when no one thinks. Did anybody think he was coming back at 420 today? Possibility. I'm telling you, we're living in that generation. I know we don't want to keep talking about the war in Israel, but... I'm probably going to give a briefing every Sunday if there needs to be one. And the thing I want you to highlight on right now is that we're in a perfect climate for the Antichrist. We need somebody with a solution. And so we're set up right now where I think the Antichrist could be 
getting prepared to show up. Now, the crazy thing is, if I read the Bible correctly, he cannot be fully revealed until the church is taken out of the way. So this is crazy time to be living in. And again, we're watching this war. I hope you continue to pray for the innocent victims in the Gaza Strip, that you pray for the hostages, you pray for these young soldiers in the Israeli army that has to do what they have to do. I pray for peace in our country. I, I didn't think I'd ever see the day where our country is so divided. I and mean, we're really divided. And you see all the hatred and venom on each side? Uh, we, we, we need to do a lot of praying. And that's why I'm coming to the sermon today called Divine Reminder. I have absolutely no intentions of bringing you anything new and fresh today, but reminding you of what we need to be doing as Christians. We need to be praying. We need to refocus on prayer. We need to refocus on it. So I'm going to watch the clock. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to end, and I'm going to go home. And I uh, just came off a fast a day ago. I think I'll eat tacos and burritos today. <laughs> I haven't had Taco Bell. I haven't had my dose lately. And uh, so, Father God, anoint this sermon. Use me, speak through me, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I chose an Old Testament story to preach on today because it closely relates, I believe, to what's going on in Israel today. You'll see. It's pretty crazy. It's also a great spring, springboard for what I want to say about prayer. So let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, what is happening here is there's, there's a confederation of armies that's coming against Israel. Do you see why I'm teaching this today? This is not their first rodeo. So there's a confederation of armies coming against Israel in our text today, and it seems as though that they're outnumbered and they're in big trouble. I mean, it doesn't look good for Israel. As today, we're getting kind of nervous for them with Hezbollah joining the war and everything. So it's kind of the same scenario. But let's look at what God says to the king Jehoshaphat in verse 3 and 4 of this text. Jehoshaphat, this man of God, was afraid. And he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Now here we have a man of God who's afraid. Even men of God sometimes have things happen in their life that scares them. Now, what was he afraid for? He's afraid for his children. He was afraid for maybe his spouse, his friends, his relatives, the people that he ruled over, because things did not look good. Now, can anyone relate how sometimes things happen to us that scare us? Uh, you go to the doctor and he goes, hey, hey, tell you, but I found a lump in your breast. I found a lump. And all of a sudden we go, oh, I'm afraid. Uh, I hate to tell you, but we have found cancer in your recent tests. Uh, your arteries are plugged. Uh, we want to let you know we're letting people go at the company and you could be one. Uh, spouse tells you they want a divorce and all of a sudden you, you have these scenarios where your heart sinks and all of a sudden you see your life pass you before your eyes and, and you feel like the game is over. Now, whatever you do very first at times like that, your first response very often has a lot to do with what you're dependent upon to save you. Um, for example, whenever something bad happens to you and you have fear in your heart because of what could be the results, what's the first thing you turn to? Because the first thing you turn to is probably that thing that you think is going to save you. For example, you hear something and the first thing you think is, I got to call a lawyer. I got to call a lawyer right now, man. Or something happens and you think, the first thing I've got to do is call my doctor. Man, I've got, got to get him now. I've got to keep calling until I get him. Or you, you turn to a policeman, 911, because you think that's the, the, the thing that's going to save you. I'm going to turn to the fire department, on and on and on. Jehoshaphat, the very first thing that he turned to is God. Now, sometimes when I'm preaching, I almost feel like I need to apologize or at least... I feel like I need to expect you to 
uh, doubt what I'm saying when I say that I feel like I have a spiritual camaraderie with, with Jehoshaphat. Because honestly, when bad things happen to me, my first response by far is to get along with God. Before I call anybody, talk to anybody, um, when I had this first cancer and second cancer, I've had two really serious cancers. Uh, the first thing I've done in both of them, when I heard I had cancer, and the first one I had a short length of period of time to, to live, the second one could have been life-threatening too. The first thing I remember that I did was I couldn't wait for Debbie to leave. She was going somewhere. I wanted her just to get out of the house so I just be alone with God. I want to be alone with God. I had to talk to God ASAP. There's times where I can't get into my prayer closet fast enough. I'm going, God, I need you. I need you right now. I need to talk to you. Because once God gives me his perspective, I don't have to worry. And, and so who do you turn to first? Now, in our text, Jehoshaphat turns to God. And I understand this totally. Now, if he didn't really believe that God was the answer for his dilemma, he was wasting precious time. He shouldn't have been taking up precious time to talk to God if he didn't think God was going to answer his prayers. Instead, he should have been talking to his generals and his army. He should have been planning strategy and, and war plans, and he might should have been going out to the neighboring nations asking for help in this war. Uh, if he didn't believe God was going to answer, he's just wasting time. That's all he was doing. Let's look at verse 5 through 13. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now see, that's the God I serve. Same God. Hasn't changed. He loves me as much as he loves Abraham. He loves you as much as he loves Abraham. The God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. That's the God we need to focus on right now. Iran's not in control of that war over there. Hamas is in control of that war. Hezbollah's not in control of that war. Israel's not in control of that war. God is. God, God's the boss. God will say what happens. Did you not, O oh our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give Israel to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? He's given the land to him forever. Remember, that's not the Palestinians' land. That's not the Jewish people's land. That's God's land. And he can do with it whatever he wants. So, and then, then this goes on. You see the parallels here. They have lived in it. Now, we could compare this to West Bank, to Gaza Strip. We could compare this to Golan Heights. They have lived in it. In other words, Israel's let the Palestinians live in these areas and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, should evil come upon us? Should evil come upon us? Should the sword come or judgment or pestilence or famine? We already know what we're going to do. We are, we're, our mind's already made up. We will stand before this house before you for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and what? You will hear us, and you will deliver us. God would say to him, let it be to you according to your faith. Do you have that kind of faith when you go to prayer? You will hear me. You will deliver me. You will talk to me, or I wouldn't be wasting my time. Now behold the sons of Ammon and Moab, Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade. Now here we get back. I kind of got ahead of myself. West Bank, Gaza Strip, Golden Heights. The sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let us invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and didn't we they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they're rewarding us? And you can almost modernize this and, and kind of change it. We've let the people, Hamas, live in Gaza Strip. We've let Hezbollah, you know, dwell safely up on the Lebanon border. We have let the Palestinian authorities live well in the West Bank. And look how they're rewarding us, coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. Does this not speak to what's going on? Wow. So our God, will you not judge them? For we're powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. 
nor do, do we, we don't even know what to do. But I love this last phrase. But our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. This is where Israel needs to get today. They need to get to this place where they pray this same prayer. Somewhere along the line, I think they will. I think that's prophesied. And they might lose these wars, uh, or they might be in the process of losing these wars before they come to this point. So I love the way he ends this prayer. He goes, we don't know what to do. That's you sometimes. That's me. God, I, I, I got cancer. I, I don't know what to do. God, I have heart disease. I don't know what to do. God, I'm losing my marriage. I don't know what to do. God, I'm losing my job. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are fixed on you. They're fixed on you. Love the way he ends this prayer. Now, Jehoshaphat had developed such a lifestyle that he believed that God would help him even before he went to prayer. Prayer was his great hope in life. No matter come what may, he always has God to turn to. Years ago, many years ago, my daughter called me, Tara, and she's crying. It's going through something really big. And I said, Terry, keep in mind, we know God. We're not like the rest of the world. We know God. We can pray through anything. I've taught you that as your dad. Dads, this is your, your purpose. I've taught you as your dad. We know how to pray. We know how to get a hold of God. So what, what Israel is doing here is they're, they're, they're doing that very thing. They're just saying, you know what? We have experience in prayer. We know it works. And we're going to go to God. Now, he says, our eyes are on you. Now, once we pray about situations in our life, and we leave with the same attitude Jehoshaphat had, we go, God, our eyes are upon you. God, our ears are open. We prayed. We've given you this problem. We believe in the Bible. It says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. We believe in the Bible where it says everything you're anxious about, don't be anxious about it, but submit it to God in prayer and he'll give you peace because you, you know he hears you. We've done all we can do. We presented it to you, but now we will leave our prayer closet with our eyes on you and our ears open to see what you do and to see what you say. That's the anticipation that should come out of our prayer closet. We've given it to God. Now we're going to watch. Now, why... Would we even pray if we didn't fully expect God to answer our prayers? Why? We got to ask ourselves the question today. If we're not praying hardly at all, what are we missing? Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, he prayed all the time. He always, seen, he always saw a need to get away and pray. I think I'm made in his image. I think Jesus felt like me very often. He says, man, I just got to get away from the crowds. I got to get away. I, I got I to get alone right now. I got to talk to the Father. I got to talk to the Father. That's what I do. Debbie, go ahead and go. Go, go, go do what you got to do. Debbie, go. Baby, say, what are you going to do? Just go. I, I just got to get alone with God. I got to hear God. And I, I'm fully expectant that I can get through to God. Now look at verse 14. They, they said, our eyes are on you. We prayed. Now, I don't know what you're going to do. Now, he could have sent an earthquake after they prayed. He could have sent a, a hurricane after they prayed. He could, but no, he did something. Ever. It says then, then. Say with me then. Now, see, then is after they prayed, right? This then wouldn't be there if they had not prayed. Then, in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benani, the son of Jael, the son of Manah the Levite, and the sons of Asaph. You don't know what God's going to do. But he did something, didn't he? Now, they didn't expect this. They, they didn't know what they were looking for. And all of a sudden, the Spirit falls on this prophet. He goes, thus saith the Lord. Well, hey, he's moving. You can never estimate what God's going to do, can you? And so, okay, all right. We're listening. We're listening. Now, as Tony Evans said some time back, he said, prayer has become for many like the national anthem. It's a traditional thing we do that really has nothing to do with the game that's fixed to be played on the field. Nothing to do with it. Just a tradition. See, sometimes I'm asked to go to a big social event somewhere through the years, and they say, Pastor, would you open us up in prayer? And I know what they're saying. It's traditional that we pray. 
And we want to, you know, give you part of our program, so open up and pray. Now, I've been to a lot of these things, and I've seen other people pray. They go, Father God, we thank you. We're here today, and we love you, and uh, just thank you for everything, and, and be with us tonight. Amen. And you go, what in the heck did that do? See, people, I tell people quite often, they want me to counsel them. I go, are you sure? Are you crazy? You want me to counsel you? Because I'll tell you what's up. You know, you're not paying me. I'm not earning. I, I, I don't know if you want me to, to counsel you. Sometimes they'll come up for marriage counseling, and I'll look at the dude, and I'll say, you know what? It's all your fault. What? It's all your fault. What? It's all your fault. You're the priest of the household. Get this mess in order. Get it in order. I mean, I'm, I'm not a cool counselor. If you want the truth, come to me. But, but if you don't want the truth, stay away from me. I don't care if you give, you know, a million dollars this church. I'm going to tell you like it is. I'll probably cry afterwards, but <laughs> I'll tell you like it is. And so, lo and behold, uh, I don't know where I'm at now. Where was I? Uh, yeah, pr- prayers become just a, a tradition. Uh, like, for example, I, I, I was invited a couple times to teen challenge things, events they have, and say, Pastor, would you pray? And sometimes I'm the speaker, too. But I just don't come and say, Lord, you know, we're here. Bless this, you know, da-da-da. I'll probably come up and pray something like this. Say, Lord, right now we're here with all of these wonderful people who have decided to change their life. And right now I pray for every discouraged person here right now that you would put a spirit of perseverance on them in Jesus' name. Lord, for all those that are worrying about their family, how they're provide, Lord, somehow divinely provide for their family and then let them get the message that you're doing that so they can stay in the program. And right now, I bind the enemy from this person, that person, in Jesus' name, I command you to stop putting this guilt trip on someone here because they're not home with their family. They belong in it. And I'll pray, man, when I get through, it's like, amen. Will we accomplish some business? You know, I think that's one reason I don't do weddings anymore. I've retired from weddings. It's because I don't like to do ceremonial stuff. I want to preach. Now, funerals are a different thing. You can preach at funerals. Um, but long story short, uh, we've reduced prayer. We've reduced it to something it's not supposed to be. I watch Fox News and CNN very often. And so often they'll say, our thoughts and prayers are with you. They'll tell the hostages, parents or whatever. Really? I, I hope so. I hope you're not just using this as a phrase, but I think most of them are. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. That's what you're supposed to say. In in these kind of situations, that's the appropriate thing to say. But do we really mean it? Our thoughts and prayers are with you. And by the way, after we get off the air, could you tell me your special needs so I will know exactly how to pray? That's what I'd like to hear. That'd be cool. So we have to uh, stop downplaying prayer. Don't turn it into a cliche or a, a platitude or, or just a ceremonial thing. Now, let's look at the content of what this prophet says after they prayed. Uh, let's start with 15 here. Did we do 15 yet? Uh, and he said, here's what he said. He said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours but it's God's. Now, when I worry about this church, and I've been known to do that sometimes, I have to keep thinking, this is God's church, it's not mine. I'm just a foreman here. He owns this place. He cares more that you have a building than I do. He cares more about your needs than I do. I'm just a foreman. And I told you before, and some stuff's redundant because the message is called Divine Reminder today, that when my body starts breaking, I say, God, you got a problem. If you want me to keep doing what I'm doing, you got to fix it. It's not my problem. I mean, you know, I can die tomorrow. And I mean, I can take some happy pills before I die, and I could die with a smile on my face. (laughs) They've got all that today. And I'm telling you, when I go to die, you can make me high as a kite. I don't care. I'm going home anyway. (laughs) You say you're too real. Well, we're all real. Now, he refocused their attention. That's what he did. He said, this is God's battle, not yours. 
Now, you're there to fight if God wants you to fight, but it's his battle. Look at verse 16. It goes on, it says, tomorrow, here's what I want you to do. You go down. You just show up. Show up to the battle. Behold, they will come up to, by the ascent of Ziz. You'll find them at the end of the valley, not the start of the valley, in front of the wilderness. By Jer- How specific can this get? He says, here's what you do. And he says, you need not fight in this battle. And I'm tired. Christians, I love you to death. But people use this as a, for everything. Well, you know, as God said, it's, you know, you don't need to fight in this battle. In this battle, you don't need to fight. There are some battles you need to fight. David had to fight Goliath. There are battles God will say, you go out and fight, and you fight, and you stand. And there's other battles he say you don't need to fight in this battle. Station yourself, stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out and face them. For what does it say? What does it say? Who's with you? The Lord is with you. See, sometimes I just have to show up. You know how many times God tells me to show up, and I go, why? He says, don't question me why. Some years ago, I was somewhere, and I told Debbie, I got to get home. I got to be at a funeral. I got to be at a funeral. I've got to go to this funeral. I don't know. God said I'm supposed to be there. I'm supposed to show up. I wasn't doing the funeral. You just show up. And I did, and it, it turned into this great God story. But I just, I had to show up. See, God can make big things out of little things when you just show up. I had a pastor friend up north, and I can't remember all the details, but they, they were trying to get a building for the youth of, of Lincoln County or whatever, they felt God told them they're supposed to have this building. And they raised money. They had a certain amount of money they could bid with. They showed up to this auction, and this rich multi multimillionaire showed up to bid against them. And he told them, he said, you, you might as well go home. I got a lot more money than you do, and I'm going to get this building. They said, nope, God told us to show up. We're going to stay. So they went into bidding uh, in, in the morning auction, and God told them precisely what to do. Every time this rich man bid, they would bid a little bit higher and say, this building is for the youth of Lincoln County. That's what he told them to say. He told them precisely. And so the guy would bid a little higher, and they'd bid a little bit higher. They'd go, this building's for the youth of Lincoln County. He'd bid, this building's for the youth of Lincoln County. So they had a break, and these people uh, in the congregation of my friend's church, they came to him and said, Pastor, it's not working. This guy's going to outbid us every time. What do we do? He said, you just keep doing what God's told you to do. Don't stop. Go back in there and keep doing it. So they got almost to the top of their limit. And, and, and like the 50th time, he'd bid a little more than them, playing cat and mouse. And they'd say, we bid this because this building's for the youth of Lincoln County. And they were used to, they would say this, and in 10 seconds, he'd bid 10 seconds. All of a sudden, there was silence, 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 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, minutes. And the guy said, uh, I think this building is for the youth of Lincoln County. I'm not bidding anymore. Uh, sometimes we just have to show up. And do what God says to do and say what God tells us to say. Let me paraphrase the rest of the story. God tells them they don't have to fight in this battle. And uh, he tells them that they will have victory. Now, get this. They believe this so much that you know what they did? They went and got the choir together and told the choir to lead the army into battle. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. That's how much they believed in it. They took God's word as solid gold. Very often when I'm going to battles, one of my favorite songs, I'll go, uh, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. And I'll, I'll sing on my way. And God arose and his enemies were scattered. And God arose. That's scary if you're in the car with me. I go, we're winning this battle. I'll tell you what, when, 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 your prayer request turn, when your prayer request turns into praise, you got a handle on it, man. You got a handle on it because praise releases faith. Now, they started praising God. They had the army up front, and it says the enemy was thrown into confusion, and, and the enemy was defeated thrown into confusion. See, praise can confuse people. I've often wondered what would happen. You know, you go to Vegas, do these casinos, you hear all this loud music, rap music, some nice stuff. What would happen if we put elevation worship on over those speakers? We, we hijack the speaker system. I wonder, I think all hell would break loose. Don't you? 
what? You know, get that music off, you know. Uh, it confuses people. I've known a couple of guys in my life, two different guys, and they both have the same style. They'd go to fight somebody, and they'd go, come on, they'd laugh the whole time. Before they start fighting, they're just laughing. You go, man, what are they hearing that I'm not hearing? <laughs> this is scary. <laughs> I want out of this. Uh, Mike Maggard once said some of the special forces in the army, they yell, and they, they, they celebrate as they're going out in war, and they're laughing and yelling. That scares the enemy. Throws them into confusion. And so this praise really put the, the final icing on the cake here. Uh, as they, they praised the Lord and put the army out in front. What a story. Now, listen up. I had to tell several people this last few months. This, you need to hear this. Bless your hearts. A lot of you are new, new to Christianity. You're new to walking with the Lord. But I, I have people write me all the time. You know what, Pastor Ron? I was praying for this spouse and it didn't happen. I was praying for this, it didn't happen. I'm praying, God is not there. I'm, one girl said, I'm mad. I'm not even coming to church anymore. And I wrote her and I said, listen to me, sweetheart. Prayer has never been and never will be the, for the purpose of getting your will done. It's only for the purpose of getting God's will done. Can I say that again? Some people are very confused. Prayer was never meant to get your purpose done. It's only ever meant to get God's purpose done. It's not for you personally. Unless the two coincide, which they do very often. When they do, then, hey, cool, cool. For example, if you're praying, you're single and you're praying for a spouse, praying for a spouse, praying for a spouse. Oh, God, and I, I think I have one picked out. I like that person. Lord, I want them, I want them, I want them, I want them. Please, God, uh, influence them to be my spouse. I, I want you to help me win them over. And God might say to you, and he'd say, you know what? If I made that person fall in love with you, how would that further my kingdom? How would that further my kingdom? Interesting, huh? And if not, I'm sure he's not in. Uh, God, I'm asking you to give me a job with better pay. I, I need a job, better pay. God, I want you to come through, come through for me. And God might ask you the question, why would I want to answer that request? Why would I want to get involved? Now, if you said, God, because, number one, I'll have more money to tithe. God said, okay, you got my ear. You got my ear. And also, God, I've already ministered to everybody at this particular job, and I need more people to minister to. God said, you really got my ear now. Now we're going to look at this thing. Did, did, did you get what I'm saying? How many of you get it? Okay, the rest of you hang on. Maybe you'll get it before this is over. Because this is a divine reminder, uh, let me just paraphrase. I'm not even going to. Well, now let's read the word. There's power in the word. Even though you've heard this verse a hundred times, hear it one more time. 1 John 5, 14, 15. This is the confidence we have before him. Confidence. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And of course, if we know that he hears us, then we know we get the request we've asked from him. 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask to receive from him, because we keep his commandments to do the things that are pleasing in his sight. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you want. It's going to be done for you. It's going to be done. Now, now, I got to say, hold on, Ron, just read one more verse. John 14, 13 through 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Do you understand this? Can I tell you? If you, I will tell you this. If you pray according to God's will, 100% of your requests will be granted. This is too much for my brain. God's given me a blank check almost. He said, Ron, there's things I want to do in your life, but until you pray, I can't do them. Can, can, did you hear me again? Do you know how many things we could pray this week that's according to God's will? Do you know how many we could pray? And every one of them, if they're according to God's will, we're going to get it. Every one of them, 100%, not even 98%, 100%. We've been given this awesome opportunity that if we pray, and, and, and I'm going to say more about it in a second, anything according to his will, we're going 
to get it. Let's go back to what we were saying earlier. At the men's retreat, I told the men that God gave Adam a purpose before he gave him a wife. They told some of the single men, you really want a spouse? Why would he give you a spouse if you have no purpose? If you're, if you're not in the purpose of God to such a degree that you need help, why would he give you a helpmate? And on the other hand, if you're in church and you see this knockout woman, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa God, you did a good job there. <laughs> wow. She's nice. And she loves God with all her heart. She serves, man. Now, if you're able to go to God and say, God, I'm single, she's single, we both love the Lord with all our heart, and you give me a job that I, I, I'm in up over my head. I can't even, man, I need help with this job. How about she make good help me? What do you think, God? See, that's the kind of relationship I have with my father. No, I'm not looking for a woman. I don't mean that. I mean, that's just the kind of relationship I have. I'm, I'm fine with the one I have. Let me tell you, she's good. She keeps me in line. Uh, so, I don't get it. Why aren't we praying? I don't get it. I'm, uh, Ron, go on. You can finish this in a second. Got about 10 more minutes. Uh, let me give you two keys to successful prayer in your life. If you want a successful prayer life, two keys. Number one is this. God wants to use you to be an answer for other people's prayers. I had a video I played first service. I'm not going to play a second service, but we... Uh, have a fantastic church that Pastor Adam Perez is doing up in Lindsay. I'm so proud of Adam. Adam is in Lindsay, and he's got like 250 people already in his church in Lindsay. That's a little bitty place. He's packing that place out. What a job Adam's doing. And he said, Pastor Ron, he said, every service we play a God story right before a service. And he had a God story, a very simple guy, lovely brother. He said, man, my God story this week is I was walking out in the park, and I was walking along, and I saw a guy on a bench, and I heard this voice say, go over there. Go over and talk to him. Go talk to him. And so I went over, and the guy said, wow. He said, I feel like I'm supposed to talk to you. He said, wow. He said, I was just sitting here praying, God, if you're real, send somebody over to talk to me. Wow. Wow. And Adam, Pastor Adam is teaching these young people to walk with God. See, the Bible says that as a sheep follows the shepherd because they know his voice, you all hear God's voice and you, you, you follow his voice. He's talking to us all the time. What's the problem? The problem is there's just too much noise. We get in the car, radio on. We, we get in the house, TV on. Well, see what it is? We're busy. It's like, if you can imagine right now, somebody standing three foot away from me trying to whisper to me, and I'm going, hey, let's go golfing this. Yeah, let's go golfing tomorrow. Woo! We got a day off. Let's go, okay, let's get out there. Let's hit the golf ball. I'm in my car, man. This voice is still whispering to me. I turn on my radio, and then I go in. I turn on the TV. I tell my wife, here's what happened today. This voice is still going, Ron, Ron, Ron. And I'm sitting here, man, and I'm busy every moment. I don't have any kind of peace or quiet. Ron, Ron, Ron. If I would slow down every day and listen, Ron, what? I think I hear you. Yeah. I'm going to suggest something to you that's really going to help you. I want all of you to make a prayer list and take it for the Lord every day. Prayer list. Maybe write down 5, 10, 15 people you're praying for. And then every day, I want you to, you can do this in 10 minutes or 30. Pray over each person and say, God, have a notebook with you or your notepad. And say, God, I'm praying for them. And right now, is there anything you'd want me to encourage them with? Anything at all? a verse, text, or anything, and just stop. And if he gives you something, write it down. Go to the next one. And after you go through your prayer life during the day, just text them with a little verse or whatever God tells you to give them, and you watch if you don't start being flooded with God's stories. See, everything's simple to me. It's, everything's simple. Remember Elijah needed to hear God, and he went up on the mountain. There was a strong wind. There was an earthquake. There was fire, and he kept thinking God was going to be in the strong wind, the earthquake, the fire. In other words, man, I'm going to church Wednesday night, and man, that preacher's going to preach, man, and I'm going to hear God. And I, leave, and I don't hear God. But you get in your car, and you have some quiet time, and God goes, here I am. I'm right here. Yeah, I need to say something to you. Uh, it says that God wasn't in all these things, but he was in the, the gentle breeze. There was a gentle breeze. 
And God was in that breeze, that sound of a gentle breeze. When was the last time you heard that gentle breeze? When was the last time you responded to just a gentle breeze from God? You're alone, you're focused. See, in the perfect world, we'd have this time of focus every day, every day. Have at least time we just got slow. Good, just would say, I want to put everything. I don't want to worry. I don't want to, I just want to be still for God. And then you look at your prayer list and one of them is going to pop off the page at you almost every day. It's all so simple. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all so simple. The last one I want to end with, and I just want to say a few things about it, is that uh, when you know God's will, don't stop praying. Now, Brad in Vegas, when we went to Vegas to start a church over there, I thought I knew why we were starting the church. And Brad kept coming to me. He goes, Pastor, I've been sent to be the pastor here. Brad, Brad was our youth pastor, our high school pastor. He said, I'm supposed to be the pastor here. And I go, I don't know. I don't see that, Brad. I'm telling you, every week or two, Pastor, God's telling me I'm supposed to be the guy here. I'm supposed to be the guy here. And he just kept up like a pit bulldog. He just, man, I'm praying. I'm praying this today, and I'm praying that. And today, he's the pastor. We're doing a fantastic job. Uh, but he kept hanging on to the promise. He kept hanging on to the promise. Now, parables in the Bible are taught to either be a contrast or a comparison. I, I hate to even say this because there's a bunch of men that I respect very much, fellow pastors, and they have big churches, some our size, some bigger than our size. And I hate to say that I disagree with two or three of them on the way they teach these parables, two of them. And it's okay to disagree. It doesn't mean I lose my respect. I, I just think they're teaching them wrong. And they probably think I'm teaching them wrong. But I heard one of them comment this week, and it really concerned me because I knew his congregation was hearing this, and I think this is going to prevent people from having God's stories. But he, he talked about the parable, in, and I think he was talking about the one in Luke 18. And he said, this parable is to be a contrast. In other words, he's not saying here that we're to do like the lady did with the judge. He's not saying that. And I say, doggone, he is saying that. He says, no, it's a contrast. I go, I disagree with you. That's not a contrast. That's a comparison. And, and again, I'm telling you, and I, these guys are better men than me, some of them. I mean, these are good men, and I still respect them. But man, you better pray about where you go to church at because it's going to make a big difference in your life. I mean, it, it's a difference having God stories and not God stories. And we must be doing something right because we have the most God stories of any church I've ever heard of. God is moving. But in, in Luke 18... A judge who didn't fear God is in this parable. He's a judge who didn't fear God. Now, there's where your contrast is at. God, God is not like him. But, but the spirit of what's going on is a comparison. There's a judge who didn't fear God and uh, a widow who needed legal protection. And it says she kept coming to this judge. I need legal protection. And he said, no, nah, no. Nah. She kept coming. 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 Until finally she wore him out. He said, hey, I'll give you what you're asking for. Now, they say this is contract, that God doesn't do that. That's not God. God's just trying to do contract. God doesn't do that. And I'm going, yeah, no, it's a comparison. God's not the evil judge, obviously. But they say, no, the, 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 that, that parable doesn't mean to keep praying all the time. I disagree because the very first verse, the very first verse tells you what the parable's about. Look at 18.1, the first verse that introduces this parable. And Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. There it is right there. That's exactly why I gave the parable. To show you to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Let me give you another version of the same verse. He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. What makes you lose heart when you're not seeing the answer to the prayer? But you got to keep up, keep up, keep up. Second parable is in Luke 11. A person has unexpected visitor who shows up at midnight. And in, in those days in that culture, hospitality is a huge thing. It's an obligation. So a visitor shows up at this person's house, and uh, at midnight, they didn't expect him. And because hospitality is such a big thing, they went next door to their neighbor to see if they could borrow three loaves of bread. Now, in those days, if you went to a house, you'd have a bottom floor that was probably a lot bigger than the top. Top, the people would be sleeping. In the bottom, they'd bring their animals in, their cow, their donkey, they bring their chickens in so nobody stole them at night. They'd put them in the bottom floor. So right now at midnight, 
the cow is snoozing, the donkey for once has stopped making noise, he's settled in, the chickens are all calm, the kids are asleep, and all of a sudden what happens? A knock. Who is it? It's my neighbor next door. I need three loaves of bread. Go away. I got everything settled down in this house. I'm not going to get up and get the, the donkey braying again and the chickens cackling and, and get the cow mooing and kid. No, oh, go away. I'm not going away. I need three loaves of bread. I'm not going away till I get them. Now you say, is that parable about continuing to pray? Yes, it is. Why? Because the ending verse of this parable tells you what it's about. Look at 11.9. It tells you exactly what it's about. This is the Amplified. And I say to you, this is right after the parable, right there with it. Ask and keep on asking and don't stop asking. It'll be given to you. Now, does it say ask one time and it'll be given to you? Does it say that? Ask and keep on. Don't, then it'll be given to you. So the people that are being taught that this is totally a contrast, they're going to stop asking. Wasn't God's will. Maybe it was God's will. You didn't hang in there long enough. Keep on asking, it'll be given to you. Seek, keep on seeking, you shall find. Knock, keep on knocking, the door will be open for you. I have a bad wrist. I've been praying for a miracle. I haven't received the miracle yet. And I, I'm, I'm starting to schedule surgery to get it operated on, but I haven't given up. I'll pray until the surgery's here. If God doesn't heal it, then it wasn't his will. Real simple. My world, things are very simple. God wants me to go down a different road. God's saying, Ron, I can't fix everything for you divinely, because if I do it for you, I'll have to do it for everybody, and pretty soon, everybody will be following me for wrong reasons. Some things you have to go through like anybody else. And you can handle this, Ron. It's not too much for you. You can handle it. But I'm not going to stop praying until I have surgery. I'm not going to stop praying. Every night, I reach up and say, God, you can heal it. You can heal it. I know my God can if he wants to, and if he doesn't, I, I'm fine with that. Totally fine. And if they say this is totally a contrast, what do they do with the story of Elijah? He prayed for the cloud, 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 and we're supposed to be like Elijah. So the idea here is that God wants to set in motion all details that will be needed in order for him to answer our prayer. But we have to pray these details in place one by one. See, my cancer, the first one I had, I was given a short time to live, not long. And uh, UCLA was very emphatic about it. But I, God started giving me words, and you know the story. I'm not going to, you know, bore you with the details again. God gave me so many miraculous signs, say, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. He never said he'd heal me. I think that's very, twice now, two cancers. He's never said, I'm going to heal you. But in both cancers, he said, you're not going to die. Now, there's a process needed to take place for me not to die. First of all, God had to wear me down to go let a guy named Pastor Glenn Brown pray for me. Pastor Glenn Brown's radical. He's crazy. Tonight. I'm not going, no, no, I'm not, he's not paying me. Debbie says he's got to, no, 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 you know. But listen to me closely. Hear what the Spirit's saying. Glenn Brown had the prayer that I needed prayed over me. Nobody else up to this point had the prayer. Again, this does not go with what I've told you forever. If the pastor down the street has 300 in his congregation, 300 people, and he's dying, and they call me, Ron, would you pray for our pastor? We already have 300 praying. Why should 301 pray? Because more than likely, I'm so crazy, I might pray something nobody else prays. So now with that in mind, Glenn Brown is the only one that went and laid hands on me, called every spirit of infirmity out. He even addressed the spirit of cancer, whether that was a problem or not, I don't know. He prayed things that nobody else ever prayed. He took authority. That was the prayer I needed. It knocked my leukemia into remission. Knocked into remission. In fact, I've never had leukemia since he prayed for me. Now, there was a pill that came along later that may or may not have sustained me. I don't, he knocked into remission. It was still in my body after he prayed for me. I got a test. It was still there, but it wasn't coming out. And so God had to wear me down to let him pray for me because that's part of the progress of the journey of healing. You get it? And then I needed to hang in there until this pill was made. Uh, I wasn't living right with diet, everything. He tried to change these ways. See, I really believe God has actually given me. It's been God who has turned me on to 72-hour water fasting every, every month or every other month. And although I'm having a hard time getting my pants up, I never felt better in all my life. I told Debbie, man, I feel good. And so there's a process, see? It was a process, and it has to be completed 
for this prayer to be answered is step by step. Do you get what I'm saying? You got to keep praying. You know, you, it, God is not saying these parables that I want you to beg me to get your answer. Has it? No, that, that's not has nothing to do with it. God's not the kind of God saying, beg me harder. You, you got to beg harder. Get on your knees. Beg, beg, beg. That's not God. He's just saying the idea, the spirit, as you step back and frame that parable, is keep on praying different things in the spirit until the journey's completed. Set things in motion by your prayers because I've given you the keys to the kingdom. I can't do it for you. Are you with me? Does this, do you understand what I'm saying? A lot of you look like you're not with me. Let me give you an acronym, PUSH. What, what, is, what does PUSH stand for? Anybody know? Andy knows. Pray until something happens. If you stop praying, you're not, you're not going to get the God story. And if these churches are being taught all over the nation, that no, that's contrast, don't, they're not stepping back. No, if you don't keep praying, you're not going to get a lot of victories. You got to say, I'm not giving up. I, like Elijah prayed for the cloud. I don't see a cloud yet, but I'll pray a different way. I haven't seen the cloud yet. I'll pray this way now. I haven't seen the cloud yet. Now I'm going to start taking authority over spirits. I haven't seen the cloud yet. All of a sudden, I've seen the cloud. I've lived this way 50 years. I know it works. Or do we just not have enough needs to pray? Hello. You have not because you ask not. Anybody need to pray that God gives them a ministry? Or maybe improves their ministry they're already in? Does anybody need to pray about their health before they get cancer? Does anybody need to pray for their loved ones to be saved? Is it safe to say that every one of your loved ones are born again? Does anybody need a better marriage? Pray. Do you need kids that love God? Pray. Do you need to be a witness to the employees at work? Pray. Do you, do you need healthier finances so you can give more? Pray. Do you need open doors for ministry? Pray. Do you need to be a better parent? Pray. Do you think God can make you a better parent? Do you think God can give you insights? I've told you before, little things. You want to raise your kids in the admonition of the Lord? I dare you this week. Go for the Lord and say, Lord, would you place in my heart a desire to do something really cool for my kids? Would you tell me something cool I could do for them? And let's say he really goes radical. And you go to your kids Thursday morning and say, hey, God told me I have to take you to Disneyland today. <laughs> what? God told me. I prayed. I didn't expect it. <laughs> I prayed to say, what can I do for my kids? That's why they'll go, God told you that. Do you know the view they're going to have of God? Do, as that is a constant thing as they grow up, do you know the view they're going to have before God? My daughter Tara told me, said, me and Josh can never turn away from God. Dad, you, you taught us too much. You showed us God. So pray with a notebook in hand. Let's redevote our life to prayer. That's all I had to deliver today. That was it. Not a lot. It's called Divine Reminder. You say, Ron, I've heard this before. Well, maybe you need to hear it again and again until you do it. Do you understand that when I panic over something, I can't wait to, to get alone with God? Because I know he's going to hear me. Like Josh said the other day, it's almost like magic. The Bible says be anxious for nothing, but everything you're anxious about, take it to God in prayer, pray through, and the peace of God that passes understanding will be yours. It's almost magic. When I pray, like today, first service, I really messed up in first service. I just made some mess ups. I got wordy, I lost track, just everything. And I'm going to go home today going, man, first service, I, 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 I just felt, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm just going to let it out there. I watched football again nine hours yesterday. <laughs> That's going to be the last time because USC stinks and I'm not supporting them anymore. <laughs> but I tell God, I apologize every night. I know I watched Switch football today. I feel like I said, okay, I'll forgive you, but when are you going to stop? <laughs> you can't watch football for 10 hours on Saturday and study one hour and expect it to be anointed. So I'll go home and give it to God today and I'll have the peace that passes understanding. That's my life. Do you understand that if you came to see me this morning, if it wasn't for God, you would have been directed to Hillcrest Cemetery. If it wasn't for God, that's where you would have went to see me this morning. I stand here by his grace, by his healing power. And don't think because I'm 
my wife said, you, you're, just, you're just losing too much weight, Ron. It's because of my lifestyle. I'm, I'm living healthy, and this is what it does to you, I guess. I don't always like my sermons because I, I, I like to be a little deeper and give you something new, but this is what God said to deliver. I mean, no doubt about it, he said to deliver. So let, let's refocus on prayer, okay? And, and let's, let's choose to believe that when we go, let's choose to believe before we even go into our prayer closet that when we ask anything according to His will, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. But remember, prayer is for to get His kingdom done, not yours. But when those two coincide, how sweet. How sweet. God's will for me is to pastor. And I love what I'm doing. And it's so neat when His will coincides with something I love doing. So I'm not going to get wordy because of all the football yesterday. I went to bed late and I had to take caffeine to wake up. (laughs) Father God, I pray that these people will start putting more emphasis on prayer. And I pray that these people, Lord, will start believing in, in their prayers. Let them start with small things. Lord, you have to grow in prayer. You have to start with small things and over the years grow to bigger things. It's not overnight. So let us start believing in the basic elementary principles of the Word of God. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody can say amen. Amen. Love you guys. I'll see you here, there, in the air. We hope you got something out of that message. We'd love to hear what God is doing in your life. Please feel free to email us at share at vbf.org. Also visit vbf.org for the latest information, following our social media accounts, or subscribing to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you again real soon.